happens to neck muscle? Generally speaking, it's ground. So if there's a little bit of a needle tract or some fiber associated with an injection, it gets diluted when it's ground, right? Whereas a lot of this on the back end is sold as primal cuts. And sometimes it won't even be opened until it gets to the end. So I have a video, I gotta find that sometime, of a Japanese family that bought a roast from a US beef roast. It was, it was a celebration first piece of U.S. beef they ever purchased. And they were filming this because this was a big deal for their family. So they got this roast on the table all cooked up and all that, and she slices it and BBs fall out, which we'll talk about. We can't afford that kind of a black eye. You think they ever ate U.S. beef again? I have a friend of mine, she was president of the Meat Expert Federation Board uh, here the last, uh, recently, she's now the past president, but anyway, grew up Bayfield, Colorado, and then her folks have a ranch down in, in the Boot Hill. She's a wonderful advocate for the beef industry. She came and did a deal at what we have, what, what's called the Beef Academy, and she, right after she had been to Japan, she went and conducted consumer taste panels in Japan and compared U.S. beef to like Kobe beef and some of these other things. 78% of the Japanese consumers preferred American beef. So we cannot afford to have stuff like that happen because they want our meat, okay? So remember, two sides. This is kind of important from an immunological standpoint. Lymph nodes that are present in animals and people and everything else. If you vaccinate an animal on the right side of the neck, that, is, that antigen is picked up by the first lymph node that it gets to. And in that little old tiny lymph node, there's a whole bunch of processing that occurs. And in that processing, it decides, is this a problem for me? And if it is, it starts making antibodies against that right there in that little local lymph node. And then it, that antigen is sent down the chain to the next lymph node and the next lymph node. And eventually, it gets into what's called the thoracic duct, which is where it all comes together. So if you do that on the, on the right side, it's processed in several locations. If you put something on the left side, it's processed in several locations. I have no science to back this up, but it makes sense to me that especially if we want to immunize, if we split those up on separate sides of the neck, because processing has already occurred be before it comes central, we might get a better immune response. Because right here, it's a local lymph node that's starting that process. If we put everything on the, on the same side, it, there may be 12 antigens that it, this little lymph node is trying to process. If we split that and put it on two sides, maybe each, that little lymph node's only having to do six. I think that might, might give us a better opportunity for immunization. Make sure they're at least five inches apart, hands width, to give them. Remember the target area isn't very big. You got neck bones, you got up here, you got that old neck strap that's there, and then the slope of the shoulder. That's not a big target area. Now, obviously, the, we're more concerned about intermuscular injections, but that's still true with the sub-Q injection. So what does that tell you? Whoever is vaccinating on this particular animal needs to pay attention, right? Somebody needs to be careful with that. Because if, especially if you're dragging calves and you got a, you know, a two and a half, three week old, four week old calf, that's not a big target area. Smaller than your hand, right? So whoever's given that, do we have any bankers in here? Any bankers? Okay, so who do you give the, the vaccine syringe to? It's to somebody to keep them out of the way, right? The banker or whoever happens to be there. Who should have that syringe? The person that pays the most attention to detail, which generally speaking is the gals. Because the guys are interested in setting the world land speed record for cash branded before the lunch wagon gets there. That's what matters to them. The gals tend to pay attention and do it right. And so, if we're trying to immunize a set of calves, every single injection needs to be as good as we can make it. We cannot afford to be sloppy in that regard. Don't use the same syringe for modified live and Bactrans. I have electrical tape on my pistol grips to know that that's a modified live syringe. I never put a Bactrin or anything else in there because the residues from that stuff can kill your modified live vaccine, even though you rinse them. So, it, and it goes to disinfecting now. You'll read lots of stuff. I do, you should never disinfect a syringe with a product. 
Novacin, alcohol, none of that. Don't use that in your syringes. The best thing to clean this syringe with is rinse it right away with good clean water, break it apart and let it air dry. You can put a little silicone or glycerin or something like that to lubricate your O-ring or whatever, but don't use products that leave a residue because modified live vaccines are extremely sensitive and you can damage them real easy, including through UV light and heat. And so you can take and fill this syringe with a vaccine and if there's UV light present, it only takes two or three minutes to inacti inactivate the syringe of vaccine. And so you may have vaccinated the first few or, or immunized the first few, but after that you're just vaccinating because the, the virus is dead. And so this is a rig that I made years ago. It, you can take one of them ice packs you get with your vaccine, stand it up right here, you put this on there. You can, this is really movable. It protects your needle. And it also, because that ice pack in there, it keeps the environment cooler because heat is our enemy and it keeps it out of UV light. So anything like this matters. How important is it? Well, I don't know. But if, you, if you're really careful, maybe 90% of what you vaccinate is immunized if you take all these steps. You know, that's what we've got to start thinking about. Okay? So changing needles. How do you, what about the needles? What do you do with those? Well, you change every 10 or 15 head, period. So for one thing, if you're using a pistol grip, every single time you go to fill this syringe, the first thing you do is you take the old needle off and you put a new needle on without fail because that system of vaccine that you just mixed or whatever is clean. And so if you puncture the bottle with a clean needle every time, it stays clean. You suck your vaccine or whatever out and you go use that. And then as soon as, if you're given if this is a 5cc dose, there's 10 of them in here, so every 10 you're changing your needle, right? Now, if you're using a 50cc pistol grip and you got a 2cc dose, then you're talking about 25. So somewhere in between you need to switch that. You know, needles are cheap, and if we're talking about trying to, to, to minimize the inflammation associated with that puncture, if you have a barb on it, like that one, that is going to tear more tissue, right? What would tear, torn tissue result in? More inflammation, more fiber, right? So can you imagine that one? So if you hit the side of the chute going in, do you change it on the next one or do you change it on this one? You change it on this one. How would you like to be poked with that thing right there? You know what this, you see that burr that's on that one right there? That's one use. That burr was created by one injection. So from a microscopic standpoint, by the time we're six or seven down the road, we're starting to create some inflammation that can matter. So we gotta be careful. If a, if a needle gets bent, what do you do? Well, in reality, you straighten it up, right? We shouldn't, because what did we just do to that metal when we straightened it? We cycled that, that needle, right? What happens if you cycle metal? it breaks much easier. I don't know if any of you ever broke a needle off in a cow as you're working them. If you stop immediately, it's still hard to find. If you wait at all, you will not find it. Those things migrate really quickly with movement. So you bust a needle off, you stop what you're doing and get after it. Now, I've, I've been around several that get broken and we stop and you can feel the tip. You can feel where it's at. I clean it up and you, got, you have to make an incision. So you make an incision over that, you gotta get in there and remove that piece of metal. If you don't do that, what do you do? You identify it and it can't be merchantable. You cannot sell it, it's adulterated. So it becomes a beef there at the house is what ends up happening with it. You can't sell those things, okay? So how do you pick the needle? Well, the size of the animal, I don't think that matters much. This is how you pick it. Will it go through the needle or not? That's what makes your choice for you. This is an 18 gauge needle. We all know that because it's green, right? That's an 18 gauge. 16 gauge is gray. We should use the smallest needle that will allow us to inject the fluid that we're using. 
And the reason is, is because this 18 gauge needle is half the size, half the diameter of a 16. A 14 gauge needle is twice the diameter of a 16. So every gauge you go up, the diameter of that needle is cut in half. And the idea is, is that if we make a smaller hole, we have a lot less inflammation, right? A lot less likely to create an injection site blemish. Now there's some products we got to use a 16, right? Ivomec is a good example. You got to use six, Ivom, uh, 16 gauge with an Ivomec, but also it's sub Q, so we're less concerned, right? But especially if we're talking in the muscle, that's what we want. We want to use absolutely the smallest needle we can get away with. So I like to use an 18 gauge. I use a 5 8 18 gauge, 5 8 B bevel needle. Be and the reason I use a 5 8 is because I can give sub Q injections to calves. I can give IM injections to calves with that needle. And I can give sub Q injections in a cow. So I have one box of needle that pretty well fits most of what I need without having a lot of the different ones. So like, like my fall work deal, I, I've got 18 gauge 5 8 and I've got 16s. That's it. Because I can get by with just that. In our country, we tend to not have real fat cows for the most part. So in, if you're going to go in the muscle on a cow, generally a one inch needle is pretty adequate. Sometimes an inch and a half may be needed. You know, generally speaking, if those cows are that fat, they're probably a dry cow or barren some again anyway if, they have that, if they're that fat. But the thing of it is, is that we need to make these selections. Needles are not family heirlooms. You don't go to the railroad tie and pick out this year's needle for this year's works, you know? We, we really need to, we need to think about those things. We need to make sure we're changing needles often. Disposable needles are not expensive. A B bevel needle is specifically made for sub-Q injections. Now, can you use them in the muscle? Yes. But if you look at a B bevel, you notice that the angle of that bevel is much steeper. So the likelihood, this is a regular bevel, if you're sliding something under the skin, is this one more likely to pick up muscle tissue because of that long old bevel? And the answer, yeah. That's what they found when they were researching this stuff. That this steeper angle made it harder to pick up muscle tissue. So you had a greater chance of giving a correct sub-Q injection with a B bevel needle. Now the difference in, in these is the uh, The polyhub needles that are not B bevel, the cap on them is clear. A B bevel needle has a white cap that's opaque. You can't see through it and it's white. That's how you can find them. They cost the same. So if you don't have the opportunity to find these, ask wherever you're buying your needles from, say, hey, I need a few boxes of B bevels. Next time you order, order me some B bevels. It really does help. Mixing different products in the same syringe is, is not acceptable. Why? Because we don't know what that does. And obviously, any of you that's ever been around a feed yard, we used to do that all the time. It was all about putting everything we could think of into, the, into that syringe. With the last thing being B12, because it had to be red or else it wouldn't work. It, and we called them Bloody Marys, and it was everything. We, we, I can't believe the stuff we used to do. That, those cattle probably got better in in spite of us, not because of us. Because when you put mix, mix those products together, you, you may change the pharmacokinetics of all of those drugs. And maybe they don't work at all. We have to pay attention to that stuff. I already talked about sterilizing. I don't, I don't use boiling water. I just rinse mine with water and let them air dry. Air bubbles, do you kill them if there's an air bubble? No, that's Hollywood. Even IV, that's Hollywood. But, but what does do is that air bubbles displace volume. Vaccine is based upon antigenic mass. There's a certain amount of antigen that's present in that vaccine that will reliably stimulate the immune system to a certain point given to a population of animals. If we displace that with air bubbles, now we're given less antigenic mass. And it matters. And in fact, vaccine is sold by antigenic mass. Now I've toured a lot of vaccine plants and what they do is they cook a batch of bug and they make them some vaccine and then they test it to see what the antigenic density of that vaccine is. 
And if it meets a certain level, it gets this company's label on it. If it's down a little bit, it gets this company's label on it. If it gets down a little more, if it's not nearly as strong, it gets somebody else's label on it. So vaccines aren't the same. It's sold by antigenic mass. So for instance, just as a real good example, you go to the feed store and you buy a vaccine for a dog. Why is it at the, vaccine? Why is it at the feed store? Because the antigenic mass is low enough that the, result, or the opportunity for an adverse event is so low that they can sell it at a feed store. Because vaccine that has a high antigenic mass, the risk of an adverse event is much higher. That's be so it becomes a veterinary line product. Okay? As I tell kids when I talk to them, you see this, it's a little bit hard to tell, but this, uh, this old Hereford here, th there's the ears, there's the neck, here's its tail. That's the top butt. If you shave those cattle off now, they have a tattoo that's genetically placed there that has a syringe with a red slash in it. You don't put injections on the back end of cattle. You know, they're still having at the kill plant injection blemishes in the round. And we should not be putting anything in the round. We have to be better than that. Okay? When do we give an IM injection? When we're instructed to do so, right? Drugs may not perform as you expect. Expiration date, does it matter? Yeah, it does. It's not just a marketing ploy. If you look at, for instance, the expiration date on Ivomec is pretty long. It's because that particular molecule, the Ivomec molecule, molecule also has a molecule that stabilizes it. And the funny part of it is, is that that remains proprietary. That's never come off patent. So there is, is there a difference between generic wormers? Absolutely. There's been a ton of work that show that generic wormers aren't worth the money you pay for them. And so you don't save money using them. That even though Ivomec itself, that in the active ingredient has come off a patent and everybody's got it, they don't have the rest of the information, the rest of the story. Now they can back engineer that and get a pretty good idea. But the fact of the matter is, in, in subsequent testing, it always, they always show that generic, and especially, in my opinion, it's becoming more and more important, and I think it's a reason we're starting to see parasite resistance, is because our generic wormers don't kill like they're supposed to. Okay? So expiration date matters. And so what happens is, with the expiration date, is they figure out how long till it starts to dissipate or lose e efficacy. How long does that take? And that's what the expiration date is. So if you're going to mix vaccines, especially when we talk about modified live vaccines and stuff, if you have to mix them, only mix what you can use in one hour. Because it does start to uh, degrade after about an hour that it's been mixed. And so then we're starting to, if, it, if we sat there and it's been mixed for two, two and a half hours, maybe we're only vaccinating and not immunizing. Because it's degraded beyond the point where it would stimulate the immune system. So we need to pay attention to that. Storing. We store vaccine. Why is the refrigerator out in the bunkhouse? Well, it's because it froze mom's lettuce. So we moved it outside, right? She got a new one. But the, the fact is, is that all of these antigens, especially in our vaccines, they're proteins. Proteins are harmed by freezing. We don't want our vaccine to freeze. And so we have to take care of that. And we need a refrigerator that works. University of Tennessee did a study and they found out 72% of the refrigerators that they tested failed to maintain the vaccine and the label uh, storage directions in a 24 hour period. 72% of them fell out of it. We talked about UV light and sunlight, how important it is. Medical waste. Are needles considered medical waste? Absolutely. So where do you dispose of them? In reality, it's the top of the post, right? But what we should do is do these things because they are considered medical waste. And so there are companies now that will work with you, talk, ask your veterinarian, they can get these for you, and, the, and now you can get them that the postage is prepaid and all that stuff. All you do is fill it up and mail it in. They send you another one. Piece of cake. Records, does it matter? Ensures that the animals are not sold for slaughter. That is a big deal. I told you about how not knowing the law doesn't 
make any difference. It serves as protection in case of regulatory. So there was a guy in Kansas. He, he, was, he was a cow-calf guy. He sent his calves to a feed yard. They fed those cattle. They took him to the harvest plant. The harvest plant sued the feed yard because of injection site blemishes in the round. And the feed yard said, wasn't us. So they enjoined the farmer. So nine lawyers went to this poor guy's kitchen and set up their briefcases and they're all sitting around the kitchen table and they kept telling him about what the law was going to do to him for having those calves that, because there was a significant amount of trim that resulted in that case. Well, he went to the file cabinet and this said branding protocol. And he had a number one up here and he drew a arrow right there and he had a number two and he drew an arrow and down here he had number one was his black leg and this is what it was and this is who made it and this is who gave it and what date. He had a number two and then he had the same thing said weaning protocol and he did exactly the same thing. He had two pieces of paper and he went to his file cabinet and he pulled them out and said this is what I do. And he handed it to them and they folded up their briefcases and they left because he documented what he did. He showed I do not put an injection on the back end of cattle. It wasn't me. So he was dismissed out of that lawsuit because he documented what he did. Two pieces of paper saved him from that lawsuit. This is much more common now. There's a lot more litigation associated with these things. You have to protect yourself. If you treat an animal, you need to make a record of it, especially now. Individual animal health record. Make sure you identify that animal with a tag or something and make darn sure you keep that record. Because if that animal ever pops a residue, you can pull this out and say, you know, I, I observed the withdrawal. 